So this is an important story for anyone pulling off football boots this winter. Head knocks may be part and parcel of rugby and league, but there's growing evidence that footballers, from primary schoolers to professionals, are suffering long-term brain damage from the cumulative effect of their injuries. One prominent neurosurgeon is so concerned, particularly about school kids, that he moots three strikes, three significant concussions, and you are out. Here's Quinta McDermott. In rugby union, as in rugby league and Australian rules football, bone-crunching hits are an occupational hazard. Getting back into the fray following a heavy knock is the mark of every courageous player. And Steve Devine is no exception. Early on in my career, I guess it was just play on and, you know, you're fighting for a spot in the team and you're fighting for your team to do well, so it was just get on with it. In his first test for the All Blacks against England at Twickenham in 2002, Steve Devine started well. And Devine is waiting. And he's got it. But later in the first half, he sustained two big head knocks. So we have a scrum now. They just do a eight to six run around the corner and I go into tackle six and just collect his hip just there. Yes. And then I go down, um, hold my head. Um, they whip it out to Wilkinson who snaps a field goal. Um, I think at that stage, now I'm trying to stand up and I'm dizzy and mm. I, I just can't quite um, make it to my feet. And then you sustained a second knot. Yeah, I take, a, take another hit. I get a knee to the head and it uh, opens me up. So I go to the change rooms to get some stitches. The following year came another horrible head knock. Spencer, now he wants to go wide. In the Super 12 semi-final against the Brumbies, he began with a flourish. Devane! Steve Devane slides across and there is the first try. Boom. But ended the game on a stretcher, following a sickening collision with a teammate, Justin Collins. It wasn't until cheapest maybe 15 20 minutes after the hit that I, I sort of started to come to if that was bad there was even worse to come after further hits in 2005 Steve Devine was knocked out three times in four weeks during the 2006 super rugby competition suddenly his symptoms became deadly serious you know I was dead man walking really I had nothing I was just getting around the field. In his final season, 2007, Steve Devine was knocked out two more times. The second hit would prove to be his last. It knocked me out. I lost my front teeth and broke my nose and stuff. And that was it. I didn't really recover from that one. So what were the next few days and weeks like? Um, they were just basically a headache. I had a, a migraine for... Well, for two, two and a half years, really. Yeah, horrible photo. I'm clearly not very well. And um, Steve Devine's symptoms took a terrible start. toll. It must have been tough for you and your family as well. Oh. Yeah. Um, I, I, my, my second boy was born just after, and, uh, they, um, this is horrible. <sighs> All right. Sorry. Um, I, I basically, um, um, in the, in the birth care that, uh, a lazy boy, they pretty much had to wake me up for the birth. <laughs> and then, uh, he was born and, um, I went back to bed. You ready? Kick off. Brad Thorne, kick off. Ready? Go, big one. Yeah, nice, mate. Nice. For two and a half years, dogged by headaches and fatigue, Steve Devine was unable that's to play good. a real part in his young son's lives. Oh, that's a knock on. Only after his doctors had tried an array of drugs did he finally find some relief through regular oh, injections of Botox designed to dull the nerves in his head and neck. Oh, perfect. I went from, at that stage, two and a half years, I was probably three migraines a week to, to none for, for, I think it was about 10 weeks or so. I didn't, didn't have a headache. And 
Um, I, I could live again. I was, oh, I could, I was back. You know, it was, it was brilliant. You got your life back again. Yeah, but you know, they, the, it, the Botox wears off. So, you know, now I, I feel myself slipping back into that fatigue and getting some migraines, and so I just um, go back and get a bit more, and, and a week later I'm, I'm good again. All right, mate, Rugby World Cup final, OK. Oh, great nudge, mate, that's over. Good kick, buddy. For Steve Devine, it's too late to turn back the clock. But in America, cutting-edge research is taking place which may help save the lives of younger footballers in Australia and around the world. I know that this is a retired NFL player who, who uh, lived to be in his 80s. The hypothalamus. At the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Bedford, Massachusetts, a brain bank has been set up where Dr. McKee studies the brains of former athletes, including hockey players, boxers, and footballers. Just tremendous atrophy here, such small structures, almost no uh, white matter of the temporal lobe. Really quite amazing. Also, really atrophy. Most of the former athletes whose brains were donated have been found to be suffering from CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, almost certainly a byproduct of repeated head knocks. A CTE is this progressive neurodegeneration, meaning that the longer you survive with this, in, with this disease, the, the worse it's going to get. But it's a very slow disease, and it appears in all cases to be associated with repetitive, but what we'd call mild uh, traumatic brain injury. So the kind of injury that you get uh, from playing football or, or boxing or hockey. This is a disease of aging. The problem is that this disease of CTE seems to start showing its symptoms many years earlier than other diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's disease. And so we start seeing the symptoms in one's 30s or 40s, as opposed to 50s, 60s, 70s. And so we're now seeing those um, initial bigger, stronger players growing up and starting to show the symptoms. So knocked out or knock-on effect, what's worse? So important question, how dangerous are multiple concussions in younger players? Is there a time when parents should say, enough? And do you have to be knocked out on the football field to suffer long-term brain damage? Chris Nowinski is a former footballer and professional wrestler who's had his own fair share of knocks. I played defensive tackle at Harvard University. Yeah, I had my share of dings and bell ringers, but had a great time doing it. It's now nine years since my last concussion. I still can't exercise at 100% without getting a headache. I would say probably closer to 10 or 10.30. Chris Nowinski's mentor is Bob Cantu, widely regarded in Boston as the godfather of sports concussion research. Concussion is violent shaking of the brain, and the brain in every instance that the head is hit, there are two different accelerations that happen. One is a straight line acceleration, we call that linear or translational, and it stretches the neuron, the brain cell, it stretches its connection, the axon. And then the other is a rotational force, the spinning of the head. That not only stretches, but it twists, and it, it's a greater tension or strain on the nerve tissue and essentially what's happening is you're stretching and straining the nerve cell and the nerve fibers themselves. Yes. Bob Cantu, Anne McKee, Bob Stern and Chris Nowinski stand at the forefront of current research into the connection between head injuries and CTE. They're studying not just the long-term effects of concussions, but also the damage which can be caused by multiple sub-concussive hits. Sub-concussive hits, they believe, can also lead to CTE. These are injuries where the accelerations are not at a level to produce symptoms that we recognize as concussion symptoms. But sub-concussive blows can, cumulatively, lead to damage to the brain. These subconcussive hits in football, you can think of a lineman in American football, where they're lined up for every play, 
every game, every practice, and they hit their heads against each other. That's around 25 G, the force. That's about the same as running a car into a brick wall. And they do that 1,000 to 1,500 times a year. And it's called subconcussive because they're not going off the field complaining and having all these symptoms. It's just part of what they do every day. But the brain is moving around inside the skull. And it's taken something. And that's what we're concerned about. This research is both alarming and controversial. Not everyone in Australia is convinced that subconcussive hits cause CTE. It needs far more fleshing out than what has been said. It's a speculation at the moment. But I don't say that in a negative sense. I just say that we are speculating about it. There is no clear evidence. Don't stop him. But the Boston doctors are convinced they're on the right track. In America, even tiny kids are taught to give their all in a game of football. Go, go. Oh, oh my go. gosh. <laughs> Worryingly, Dr. McKee and her colleagues are now finding early signs of CTE in the brains of young footballers who've died, not all of whom sustained a diagnosed concussion. So this is the surface of the brain. We found it in the 17-year-old football player, an 18-year-old. We found it pretty extensive in the 21-year-old. So it's helped people realize that it's not just a pro athlete problem, that you're more vulnerable when you're young anyway. And so we're clearly giving this disease to children who don't understand what they're even getting into. The challenge now is to find ways of preventing long-term brain injury in football and to halt the onset of CTE in sportsmen before it's too late. In a new and groundbreaking project in Boston, a hundred former NFL players are being studied using the latest imaging techniques. What we hope to get out of studying living former NFL players is to understand a criteria through which we can diagnose this disease with confidence in living people. The question now being tackled by sports administrators is how relevant are these findings to the head injuries sustained by footballers here in Australia? I think that we need to be pretty careful how we interpret the Boston stuff because their game is completely different. You know, the, the aim of their game is to actually crash into each other with their heads. Uh, so potentially players are playing concussed. Yeah? We, we don't have any such thing in our game and we take any head contact very seriously. In the NRL, players are big enough to know the risks. But when kids play footy, parents have to decide what's safe and what isn't. I just tackled a kid and he wasn't too happy about that and grabbed my head and smacked it on the ground. Think one. Okay. Yeah. We got a phone call and told that Zach had been injured and they thought he could be concussed. Another five minutes went by. Um, we're on our way to the hospital. He doesn't know his name. He can't tell us, you know, what happened. He's really out of it. I was really dizzy. I remember in the car going like this. I was like, I just couldn't keep my mouth like shut pretty much. I just had this face about me. It was, that's what my mate told me, but it's pretty weird. Just a few weeks later, he was concussed again. And the doctor said, no, really, if it was my child, I'd be sitting him out for the rest of the season. I looked at Zach, Zach was shattered. I took the doctor's advice and we sat Zach out for the remainder of the season. So based on that, we're comfortable that he's had enough time to recover and he's ready to go this season. If he gets another knock, what will happen then? Three strikes, you're out. Yeah, yeah one more head knock and he's uh, hanging up the boots. With every week that passes, there are more head knocks, more concussions, and more players left wondering whether the damage caused will be permanent. And as our children grow up to be bigger, stronger, and faster than their parents, the test will be whether the game can be made safer for them while retaining the raw excitement of a body contact sport. We play in the backyard all the time and my oldest is seven. He loves his rugby. I don't blame rugby for what happened to me. It was good to me and I hope they have 
um, the joy that I got out of it. It's a bit of a spin on that uh, Saturday sports, doesn't it? It's understood headgear might help, but of course it doesn't stop the brain moving inside the skull, which causes concussion.